You can have a seat. Kiddos, you can go off to your classrooms. Well, as we continue in our Church at Large large series, I would like to introduce you to this week's speaker. Alex Thomas grew up in Colorado Springs and is the young adult pastor at LifeGate Church, which is just down the road from us in Denver. He's almost done with his MDiv at Denver Seminary and is passionate about seeing people come to a full realization that they are loved and cherished, no matter what has been done to them or what they may think counts them out. Alex, we're so glad to have you here with this morning. Would you all please give him a warm welcome? Well, good morning, everybody. My name is Alex Thomas. Um, thank you, Maggie, for that introduction. Before I begin, I just want to really give honor to your leadership here at the Sacred Grace. I think it's really vital and critical to really honor them. So Pastor Nathan, Maggie, everybody that runs back there, Canaan with worship, let's just, let's, let's just give it up for them really quick. As we say thank you, because without them, without their leadership, this, this, uh, this wouldn't happen. So thank you so much for having me, church. Um, it's really an honor and a blessing to be here. I just want to start by saying, who, who am I? Who is this? Who is this? I'm only 23. Who is this 23-year-old preaching up to you guys this morning? Uh, my name is Alexander Kanye Thomas. You might say, what the heck did that guy just say in the middle? No, it's not a cuss word. That's my middle name. Uh, in, in Indian culture, your name is very important to who you are. So my name comes from my first name. My, my mom and dad gave me this name, Alexander, being the defender of man, right? That's something I've been told since I was a child. Never really connected, and it, maybe it still doesn't. I don't know who I'm defending. But my middle name is my, is my grandfather's first name before he came to the United States. That was his name, and then he changed it for, for, the, for the ease of you guys, for, so, that you, so that you could say something uh, that's easier. So he went by Abraham. And then my last name is Thomas, which is also part of his name. And so this idea of a name is so crucial for me and in my Indian culture. And it also has a lot, to, it has a lot of bearing on you as well. Whatever your culture is, whatever your majority culture is, you have a name that you are given. You're given name from your parents, or maybe you've changed it if you had a maiden name, if you were married, if you changed your name. There are names that you have been given. My name holds a lot of weight. I actually have a tattoo of my name in our native language. It says Thomas in it. And this last name, Thomas, comes from the Apostle Thomas. A lot of us in Southwest India, we really claim, we hold tightly to us being the first Christians outside of the Holy Land. That's another story for another time. But this name will never depart from me. I have a lot of nicknames. My friends call me A.T., A.T. the pastor, A.K.T., Alexander, whatever it is. There are so many names that I can respond to. So if somebody calls out my name in a crowd, I can know exactly where they are. And I'm sure you're the same way. If somebody's calling your name, whether it's your mother or somebody that has known you since childhood, you could, they could be turned, their back could be turned to you, but they call your name and you know exactly who said your name. And so this idea of a name is so important to the reality of being a human being. All of us are given names. We know our name, but nobody this morning woke up and looked at yourself in the mirror like, yep, my name is this. I was born here. This is the name of my parents. This is where I grew up. No, none of you knew, none of you th- said that when you woke up, and if you did, I applaud you. That's, that's really cool. Maybe I should start doing that. But this idea of a name is something that you know, but maybe you don't really think about on a regular basis. Unless you have a name tag at work, people aren't really asking you your name too often. But every single one of you, every single one of us, has names that we are called every single day, whether that is your name or the names that the world has called you. I would say that every day we go throughout our lives receiving names, receiving the name of you are good at this. You are a mother, you are a father, you are a son, a daughter. You're good at these things. But I would also say, I would contend with you that each of us goes throughout our days receiving the names that lie in curses. You're not good enough. You'll never be good enough. You can't do this. You'll never aspire to the heights that you want to. And that is a name that we are given. I would say that there are two different types of names that we live in. It's the the reality that we are a blessing and a curse. See, God wants to bless you with what he calls you. Essentially, he calls you the beloved. At point blank, at the very foundation, God declares that you and I, we are the beloved. But as we live in this world in 2022, we all go throughout our days receiving the curses that negate this reality of being the beloved. That say, "You, you could never, you could never. You can never do what you want to do. And so there's, there's much power in a name. There is story in a name. 
We don't choose our given names. This is something we are bestowed. God bestows upon each and every one of you, each and every one of us, the name of being beloved. So we say, what is in a name? And for those of us that claim to be Christians, we say, well, we know that in a name is the reality of being the beloved. But again, that comes into question each and every day, every moment of the day. This new name that we have been given is often not received. A lot of us wake up and we say, well, I have to do this, and I probably won't do it as well as I want to, and I have these dreams that I never got to do, and I, you know, I'm doing this, but I know I'm better at that. And so we live in this reality that there's potentially something, somewhere where you, some place where you are and a different place where you want to be. And so this morning, as we think about the reality of a name, maybe you've never thought about this, I encourage you to, to really think deeply, not about how you see yourself, but about how God sees you. That's the whole idea here. So I ask you, who are you? What is your name? What is the name that you are believing about yourself? Where are you from? What are you known for? There is power and story in names, and throughout Scripture we see the power and story in many different names. And this morning we're going to look at one small but very, very significant story. If you have your Bibles, would you turn to Genesis 16? This is the story of Abram and Sarai. And if you know the, the biblical history of the patriarch Abram, before he was given his name Abraham, he, he had to go through some things. And so Abram and Sarai, they were, about, they were trying to conceive, but of course Sarai was, was old, Abram was old, and so they couldn't really come to the point of conception. And so they came up with this grand idea. They said, well, let's take matters into our own hands. Sarai says, you can, you can lie with my, my, my female Egyptian slave. She says, let's just do this because it'll work. She's young. She can bear a child. And so Abram says, sure, let's do this. And so Abram and this female Egyptian slave, they lie together, and she becomes pregnant. And so we find ourselves in verse 6 of chapter 16. This slave has now become pregnant, and Sarai is, of course, frustrated. Because the thing that she wanted to happen actually happened, and all the different circumstances that came along with that She's frustrated, frustrated, and she begins to dislike this female Egyptian slave. And so they send her off into the wilderness because they have now brought dishonor upon themselves, and they have since uh, departed from what God has for them. And so this female Egyptian slave is sent away. And the reality of this woman being a female Egyptian slave is very, very important. Because you see, in this, in this day and age, in this ancient Near Eastern culture, Females, one, were already discounted as less than than the man. So that's number one. And she is Egyptian. She is not a part of the fold of God that has been established through Abram. So that's number two of the things that are counting her out. And of course, number three, she is a slave. And it's not like chattel slavery like we've seen here in the modern West. But as a slave, she was again discounted. And so her identity rests in being a female Egyptian slave. And so that was what she was seen as. So basically they said, well, just, just sleep with the female Egyptian slave because that's all she is. And so in that identity, she has then been pushed away because the people of God has now have said, well, she's not worth our time. She's not worth being brought in, so let's send her away. So verse 7, after she's been sent away, she's on the run, she's in the wilderness Verse 7 says, then the angel of the Lord found her near a spring in the desert. And he said, Hagar, slave of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? I'm running away from my mistress Sarai, she answered. Then the angel of the Lord told her, go back to your mistress and submit to her. The The angel added, I will increase your descendants so much that they will be too numerous to count. The angel of the Lord said to her, you are now pregnant and you will give birth to a son. You shall name him Ishmael, for the Lord has heard of your misery. He will be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone and everyone's hand against him. And he will live in hostility toward all his brothers. She gave his name to the Lord, this name to the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees me. For she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. This story is very, very powerful. Every time I read it, I feel something inside of me that says, God sees. So verse 7, we see that she is found by God. And God does not say female Egyptian slave mistress of, of the mistress of Sarai. No, he says Hagar. 
He declares her name over her. Because even in the scriptures, she's referred to as the slave of Sarai. But the Lord on high says, Hagar, I see you. He says, where are you going and where have you come from? God is not staging an interrogation here, but rather he's intervening in her circumstances. This woman is on the run because she has been pushed away. I'm not sure if you've ever been in a circumstance where you've been pushed away and you feel like the only option is to run. We see that right here with Hagar. She is running away from God. And the key distinction here is she's not running directly from God. She's running from the people of God. So essentially, Hagar doesn't even know who God is. She does not yet know who the Lord God Yahweh is in her life. She's just running. She's running from things that have definitely persecuted her and hurt her. So she's running, but the Lord intercepts her. God Most High says, Hagar, where are you going and where have you come from? So at this point, we realize that Hagar doesn't even know God. She's never spoken to God. This is not a woman who is a part of the family of God. But we see that that does not matter to the Lord. He steps in and he saves her from this moment of misery and trial and suffering. God knows her name when she didn't even seek him in the first place. So there's two questions of origin and destiny that God begins to ask her. And then verse nine, God promises a blessing if she returns to him, and this is the exact same blessing that is given to Abram just a chapter before, that his descendants will number the stars. So the Lord says to her, your your descendants will increase so much to be too numerous to count. So how could this happen that, that, that God is giving the same blessing to some random, insignificant woman? Well, as we know, that that's not how God views women, and especially that is not how God views Hagar, even if the first man to receive this covenant blessing viewed her as such. So then she goes on to, to name her son Ishmael, meaning God hears. So now we know that Hagar feels seen and she feels heard. Something that I pray for the people that attend my ministry at my church is that they would feel seen, heard, and valued. And that's not just some idea that I've come up with on my own, but rather I find it in Scripture from the beginning. That God wants to see people. He hears people, and inherently he values people. This is not some idea, again, that I've conjured up, but rather we see it in the heart of God. And I can just assume that Hagar felt the power of being accepted by God, and then she goes on to, to name God. And I'm sure you've heard this before, El Roy, the God who sees. She says, I have seen the one who sees me. She married it very, very clear who God was to her in the midst of this desert situation. So we know all of this about Hagar. She says, God has seen me, I feel it felt seen and heard, and she returns back to Sarai. And then the covenants continue and we just see we see different distinctions between Ishmael and the rest of the people of God but this story right here cannot be skipped over because God has seen someone and he has heard someone and then she is now seeing herself as God sees her and so we can go on with this we can say well that's great that's great for Hagar that's an awesome story for them that's a good story to relate back to that's a good narrative allegory whatever you want to call it but that's not for me I know my name, I know who I am, I know where I work, I'm doing very well. And so maybe you don't relate to how Hagar has experienced God. You may or or may not relate to how she even named God. Is God the God who sees you? I encourage you to, to really think deeply about this. Is God the God who sees you? Or is he the God who forgets you, who hates you, who is angry at you, who abandons you? Or do we try to see him in his truth? He is the God who saves, who heals, who forgives, who redeems, who welcomes back. Knowing how we view God is extremely crucial to how we view ourselves. And of course, that's not the point. The the point of seeing God in his glory is not so we can see ourselves as such, but rather we cannot fully view ourselves as loved and receiving what God has for us until we view him in the truth of who he actually is. Is God just the the cosmic vending machine that we go to when we need something, the ATM that we just click something that we need? Is he a vengeful tyrant, uh, an aloof man upstairs, or is he very, very interested in your life? Is he a father 
Is he a loving brother? Is he kind, compassionate? Who is God to you? Something that I've been learning lately in my life is that I have realized that I, I've been viewing God in light of my, my earthly father. For the good and the bad, I'm sure all of us can relate to that in some way, shape, or form. And I've realized, well, maybe I don't actually view God in light of who he is in spirit and in truth. I'm seeing God how I want to see him. I'm seeing God as far off, only interested when he wants to be interested. But no, this story r- reminds me that that is not at all who God the Father is. That he is so interested in each and every single one of you. The parts that everybody else looks by, that is what he wants to see the most. Hagar, we see that she knew God exactly for who he was and who he is. But we have to be honest with ourselves here that sometimes we don't really want to see God. We don't want to be fully known by God. We don't want to fully let him him in. We don't want the God who sees to see us. So it's easier to skate by and just, you know, stay behind the curtain, stay in the back of the crowd, stay in the back of the room. And that's how we want God to see us. Because they can do all the front work. Everybody else can do it. But I'm just going to stay back here and I'm good back here. And for me, that's, that's how I like things to be. I'm, a, I'm an introvert. I know I stand up here with a microphone in front of you, but I would rather be sitting in the chairs sometimes. I'd rather be sitting and listening and receiving. But that's not how God wants you to view yourself as insignificant, as less important, that you should keep your voice down. No, God wants to hear from you. He wants to experience life with you. We see God knew Hagar even when she did not know him. He pursued her relentlessly even. Because imagine her being on the run in the desert and God sends the angel of the Lord to speak directly to her. I think it's interesting that we don't see anything of a dialogue between Abram and Sarai of how God said, you shouldn't have done that. I'm sure they felt conviction. I'm sure this happened, but he went right to Hagar. The insignificant one, the one who didn't matter, the one that they could just send off and forget about. God says, that is not how I see you. And so I wonder where in your life you are, if you could find yourself anywhere in the midst of this story, in the midst of this idea that God sees you. And it's not a one, one and done, well, now I'm seen by God and I'm good for the rest of my life. No, it's a, it's a constant battle. It's a constant going back and forth of, well, I know who I am, or I want to know who I am, or I, I am very confident in who I am. There's a spectrum and it's swaying. But I think one of the most important things that we can do here this morning, church, is to realize that God is in the midst of all of it. Whatever you see in the mirror, whether you like what you see, whether you hate what you see, I promise you that God is still right there, right next to you. And that's the beautiful thing about our God, that he will not abandon you, even when you have abandoned yourself. There's a second half of this story that we have to identify with, and that's the reality that Hagar was pushed away by the people of God. It was God's people who were supposed to be kind and compassionate to her that pushed her away. There are people who have been hurt and pushed away by people in the name of Jesus, in the name of the church, and that is simply not okay. And so on their behalf, I apologize if that is you, if you have been pushed away or hurt by someone in the name of Jesus, I affirm that that was wrong, and I apologize on their behalf. And so we as Christians, we have the opportunity to remind ourselves that if we are seen, we can also see others. We can choose to see people. You don't have to work at a church to see people. You don't have to work at a church to to be kind and compassionate and loving. Rather, each and every one of us, if we claim to be children of God, if we know that our identity rests in him, every single one of us is called to see people, to really exemplify and reflect El Roy, the God who sees We are blessed to be a blessing. A friend and mentor of mine, Reverend Dr. Glenn Packham, says to be blessed is to be renamed, to be given a new identity and a new purpose. Many of us, again, have these different names that we go by, these different names that we've allowed ourselves to be defined as. But each and every one of us, if we believe that we are blessed, have been given a new name. And the thing about the Christian life, as we see in a church like this, in a parish church, it's not just about us in this room. It's not just about us there in the group. Rather, every single one of us is called to go out and to see people, to see the people that are less desirable, to see your coworkers who annoy the crap out of you, 
to see your to see your elderly grandparents or your elderly parents that kind of nag you and ask you too many questions and do all these things that you are annoyed with, to see them as God sees them, to see your family members who are unbelieving, to see them, to see the people who vote differently than you, who believe differently than you, who speak differently than you, who look differently than you, you have the opportunity and the ability to see them in light of the God who sees you. We are blessed to be a blessing. This is, a, this is an honor. I think, we should see, I think we should view this as an honor that we have the opportunity to see people. And I know specifically at a church like this that you all do that quite well. I've been seen by different people at this church already. I've been seen and if you've been seen by someone, when, imagine when you're in elementary school or any younger age and someone saw you, your teacher, if you got picked last like I did, you, like, you know, when people would actually pick you earlier than last, you felt seen. There's this reality of when you are, uh, the, the reality of the human experience when you are seen and somebody calls out to you, someone points at you and says your name. So yeah, I want you on my team. I want you to be a part of this. And thinking about God, thinking about him seeing you, it's, it's not like you're ever left and he's just picking last. Every single time he picks you, he wants you and he sees you and he hears you and he values you. Not by what the world calls you, but about what he has called you. And that is beloved. So again, I ask you, what is in a name? There's meaning, there's value, there's origin, and there's purpose. There's a power in knowing where you have come from. But I would say that where you have come from, what you have been through, what you're doing right now does not dictate where you can go. We see that with Hagar. She was living in a time of suffering and persecution, but that did not dictate where she went. The genealogy of Jesus shows us even more so. If you look back, Jesus could have been anybody. We see just some random people. Of course, we have people like King David and others, but Jesus could have been anybody. I say this to say that your current trajectory is not fixed. Just because you are here right now does not mean you have to stay right here. You have the opportunity to live into that blessing that God has given you. And this is not a name and a claim it. You can pray more about it. No, rather, living in the reality that you are blessed can open doors for you that you might not even, even know. And not doors like, oh, well, God's going to bless you with a new car, a new house, new whatever. No, seeing yourself as beloved allows you to live more in tune with the heart of Jesus. Seeing Jesus in light of who he is as a son and seeing yourself in light of that, if you know what that is, you know that life becomes more abundant from there. The way you begin does not determine how you can finish. God has given you a new name, a new purpose, a new destiny, and I encourage you to step into that knowing that it's not the easiest step to take. Sometimes it feels like you're stepping off into the dark, but God will never let you fall down like that. He will not let you continue to wander around in the desert, but he will step in and rescue you. And he will say, your name, where are you going? Where have you come from? I will bless you. We see that Jesus asks, who do you say that I am in the Gospel of Matthew? And his disciples respond, but even Jesus to ask his brothers, his family, his, his people, who do you say I am? Well, we know that Jesus is the one who suffered. Jesus is the one who won. He was victorious. There are so many different names of Jesus, but we know that he is the Son of God most high. There's value in your name. And I promise you, if you don't see that, other people do. Because if God does, I mean somebody else will see that as well. So I encourage you to think deeply about this. The death that you are hearing over your life each and every day is not true for you. There is a name that you've been given and is blessed, it is beloved, it is valued, it is loved. There's a, an old psalm, or a hymn rather, that we sing at funerals um, in our native language, and it, it goes, per velikim nerem kanam. And basically that says, my name will be there. If you've heard the hymn, when the roll is called up yonder, my name will be there. And we sing this at funerals for those that have served and who are Christians who have devoted their lives to the Lord because we hope and we pray that when Jesus reads their name, it's not gonna say, Pastor, wife, husband, mother, wasn't good enough at this, could have done better at this. Rather, it's going to say, your name, the beloved. 
so friends, I encourage you to really challenge yourself because this is definitely a challenge to see yourself as the beloved. But I encourage you to look in the mirror, even tonight, this morning, whenever you see yourself again, and say to yourself, I am the beloved. I encourage my friends to do that a lot. It's a pretty weird thing to do, but if you can look at yourself and say, I am the beloved, that's one step closer. And it's not easy, it's not comfortable, it's probably terrifying to look in yourself in the mirror and say, I am the beloved, but I promise you, and I'm gonna speak that over you, that that is the reality of who you are. You are the beloved. You are valued, you are heard, and you are seen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this, this word. God, I thank you for seeing Hagar. Lord, I thank you that this is an opportunity for us to read and to see that you are the God who sees. So, Lord, we ask for forgiveness when we have seen you as anything otherwise. And, Lord, in the, in the tough times when we really struggle to see you in the reality of who you are, God, we, we want to draw closer to your heart. So, Father, I ask just for each and every person in this room, God, that we would just begin to grow closer to seeing you as kind and compassionate and loving. In the midst of circumstances, God, in the midst of loss and grief, unimaginable circumstances, God, I pray over each and every person in this room that they would begin the small process, the slow process of seeing you as the one who sees them. God, I pray that you would bless them and keep them, Lord Jesus. Lord, that they would see themselves as you see them. Pray this in your name. Amen.